Okay, well, why don't we just uh, why don't we go through our, our housekeeping notes while, while people are still joining. Uh, Jeff, if I could just get you to go to the next slide, please. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Uh, glad you can make it. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just a couple of quick points. We're going to be doing a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions uh, via the questions drop down in the control panel. Uh, and you can submit them at any time through the presentations. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible within the within the one hour. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will follow up uh, to make sure everything gets answered, uh, and all questions will be addressed anonymously. Uh, quick disclaimer, all information discussed in this webinar is for education purposes only. It should not be applied directly to the administration of any particular file or claim. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website, LinkedIn, and YouTube pages. So please feel free to pass them on to your colleagues and use them in team meetings if you wish. We'll be sending each of you a completion certificate in a follow-up email. Um, so here's a, a quick reminder. This is a repeat from uh, repeat webinar from last year. So if you're looking for continuing education credits and you've already taken this, um, I mean, please check your uh, the provincial regulations, uh, but I believe it's it's two or three years uh, to take the same course uh, and apply for CE credits. So please just double check that. Uh, at the end of the webinar, when you close the window, uh, you'll be prompted to answer a few quick questions. We would love to get your feedback. Uh, so please, if you do have uh, two minutes at the end, uh, fill out that survey. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties throughout, you can email webinar at origin-and-cause.com, uh, or you can just type a question in the in the questions dropdown. Um, and then before we get started, lastly, we've got two webinars today. Uh, after this, we're going to be doing a webinar on uh, staircase instruction and slip and fall accidents. Uh, if you aren't signed up for that, I'll drop a link uh, in the chat. Uh, if you want to register for that, uh, you can do so. We'll be doing that at 2.15. Um, so before we get started, I'll just quickly introduce our speakers. Uh, we've got Mike Rice, who's an RPAS operator and collision reconstructionist. He's got 23 years of policing experience. Uh, he's currently with the Kingston Police Service in the Traffic Safety Division uh, and as an RPAS pilot. Uh, he's a level three traffic collision investigator and level four collision reconstructionist. And I believe Jeff is gonna to touch on uh, the distinctions there. Uh, he's also uh, specialized in, <clears throat> with additional specialized training in pedestrian, motorcycle, and commercial vehicle collisions. He's a qualified commercial motor vehicle inspector trained by the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, he's qualified to image, analyze, and, inter and interpret CDR. And he's got over 25 years of experience as a paramedic, uh, although he's now retired. Uh, Jeff Inch, also RPAS operator and collision reconstructionist, 23 years of policing experience, currently serves as the sergeant in charge of a regional police service traffic unit and RPAS unit. He's a level three traffic collision investigator and a level four collision reconstructionist. He's a qualified forensic identification officer, uh, is qualified to image, analyze, and interpret vehicle airbag control modules and uh, has been the officer in charge at 171 fatal or life-threatening collisions. Uh, now, without further ado, I'm going to pass things off to Jeff uh, to get started. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mark. Can you hear me? Uh, loud and clear. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks again for joining us. Hope everyone is staying healthy and safe. Uh, Mike and I are very excited uh, to be here speaking with you about collision reconstruction, and it was stated in the previous slides. We have years of experience and we've been to hundreds of collisions amongst us and hopefully we can pass on some of our knowledge to you and uh, today and so without further ado i'll jump right into it here uh, so the plan for today is to go through obviously some introductions into the world of collision reconstruction and then we're going to go through a uh, couple case studies and uh, we'll be including a uh, case study of an actual assignment that we completed and as we will uh, go through as we are tasked um, through origin and cause. Um, but before we get into that, I just, uh, you'll probably hear me and Mike use the term uh, level one, level two, level three, level four. I know Mark used it there in the intro. Um, so basically, I just kind of wanted to explain the different levels um, of investigators. The first is a level one investigator, which, uh, and it's I'm speaking this of a police background, but a, a level one investigator 
Uh, every single police officer uh, in Ontario anyways, that goes through basic training receives uh, level one training. And as a constable, it's a pretty limited, it's limited to collecting tombstone, de tombstone data collisions, investing in collisions, and it doesn't usually involve uh, any serious or fatal collisions. It may at the start, but uh, because of the severity of the collision, it's usually elevated to a higher level of investigator. A level two collision investigator, it's a one week course, generally a member of a traffic unit. And upon completion of that course, uh, the investigator um, will be called to a lot of, will be called a scene uh, collision investigator. And they're trained to do a lot more uh, evidence collection. One of the things with collisions is, uh, you probably all know there are a lot of evidence is perishable and can be lost. So generally our level two um, officers are already working and they're usually the first on the scene and able to um, mark tire marks, mark evidence that uh, could blow away, be ran over uh, or just uh, disappear as time passes on. They're also trained with some basic uh, math like uh, slide to stop equations. Uh, a level three collision investigator, uh, better known as a technical collision investigator. At this point, you're probably a member of a collision reconstruction unit and you've completed a three week course and um, you're doing a lot more of the math and a lot more of the equation involved in the actual collision itself. Um, and then a level four is a pro professional collision reconstructionist um, whose job is to determine the behaviors and immediate causes of a collision. And um, once you're a level four, uh, a judge can deem you an expert that is um, the ability to give opinionated uh, evidence, evidence in court. Okay, so generally um, there's three phases to a collision investigation. Uh, the first one is the pre-collision phase. And I don't necessarily mean, uh, you know, that they were drinking before this happened. I mean, that could have been a factor in the pre-collision, but um, a lot of other stuff is taken consideration, like, uh, you know, they work the night shift. Um, is there something going on in the personal life? Um, something, this is actually where the mechanical parts of the cars or something pre-collision that could have caused or contributed to uh, said collision. Second phase um, is the actual collision itself. And that is basically we would go through the sequence of events and uh, find out exactly what occurred in the collision in, in the correct order. And um, the third uh, phase is the post-collision. That is basically where we look over everything that's been collected thus far. And um, it sometimes means going out and obtaining more information, whether it be a witness statements, review of cameras um, uh, that we would need to continue on to uh, for our investigation. So the uh, case studies here we're going to go through today. First one is going to be a uh, simple vehicle versus vehicle. And then uh, the second one I'm going to discuss is a motorcycle collision. And then Mike's going to talk specifically about uh, pedestrian collision and a example of a commercial motor, uh, motor vehicle collision. So this first case study here, you can see on my screen uh, in front of me, in front of us here is there's a, uh, I don't know if you guys can see my arrow, uh, but this was a Pontiac Montana. And in this collision, it struck the a pillar or the just in front of the uh, driver's door of this red Volkswagen bug. Uh, this was a serious collision, resulted in serious uh, injuries. And I'm just showing you this next slide here. This is a diagram that I did of the collision scene. And at the top here, uh, it's or not, but at the top here, there's a uh, black square of the triangle, and that represents a Pontiac Montana in this collision. Down here on the left side, there's a like a purple or pink square of the triangle, and that represents the Volkswagen uh, bug. So all of our diagrams north is always up. So you can see this Pontiac, Pontiac Montana is traveling south down this roadway, and the Volkswagen bug is traveling east. Uh, of note here, um, there's a stop bar and a stop sign for the uh, Volkswagen uh, traveling east. I believe if both these vehicles were traveling close to the um, uh, posted speed limit, which was 60 kilometers an hour for the north-south road and 50 uh, for the east-west. Um, 
one other thing here, this area up here with the dashed lines through it, that's a, a forested area um, with trees that would obstruct someone's view. Uh, these dotted lines you see here coming from the front of each vehicle to the other is what we call the possible uh, point of perception. Basically, it's defined as um, the place and time in which a normal person could perceive a hazard. Doesn't necessarily mean they do, but it means at the time that they could actually um, see the hazard or perceived hazard. Uh, so the point of actual perception, like I said, it's not the point of possible perception is not a, um, when you uh, they could actually see it, it means when they could. The point of actual perception is usually uh, a little bit after that. It's a time or place in which the hazard has actually been perceived. And that time um, is usually about three quarters of a second, but um, what we call that time is the perception delay. So that's the time between uh, the point of possible perception and the, the uh, point of actual perception. And during that time, uh, the vehicles are moving at, at around the speed limit. And um, we call that the distance traveled as the uh, perception distance. That is the distance traveled during the perception delay. In this particular case here, you can see for the um, uh, Pontiac Montana, 12.7 meters was covered. And for our Volkswagen Bug, another 11.3 meters um, was covered. So the next sequence of events here is uh, what we call the reaction, or that is a voluntary or involuntary response to a hazard. And that is the um, what we refer to as the core of the the old crap, and that's where you know we've now seen the hazard and we're reacting to it. That is the you know kind of taking the foot off the gas pedal and sliding it over to the brake pedal, or um, you know possibly grabbing a steering wheel to veer out of the way. But in this particular collision, it was a uh, foot onto the brake pedal once the drivers um, perceive the uh, impending hazards. The reaction time, and that is the time between the point they actually um, perceive the hazard and the time they react. So it, the time you take your foot from the gas pedal to the brake pedal, time has passed, and that's um, through study shown to be about three quarters of a second. And of course, during that three quarters of a second, our vehicle is still moving, and that is represented by the reaction distance. In this particular case, our Pontiac Montana travels another 12.7 meters, and our Volkswagen Bug travels 11.3 meters during that same time. Uh, the next we call is the uh, action point. And the, the action point is now when our foot is actually on the brake, that is when the, um, it's the place where a person puts into action decision based on a perceived hazard, we hit the brake or we, uh, you know, grab the steering wheel and evasive action um, is basically when we any action we take to avoid the collision that is the brake or the steering and the evasive the evasive action distance is once again the travel uh, the distance we travel during that time um, during that evasive action that's taken and in this particular case that evasive action either goes to um, the point of stop so uh, you know perhaps the two vehicles didn't collide we've taken evasive action and that distance is represented in this particular case um, you know there was an impact so the evasive action distance is from when they've started to take that evasive action to the actual point of impact and in this particular collision we can see where the uh, Pontiac Montana collided with the passenger side of the uh, Volkswagen above. So engagement uh, is pretty simple. It's the penetration of one traffic unit into the other. And here you can see where they collide, um, like in that first um, photograph I, show, I showed of the damage to the vehicle. And this is uh, final rest position or final position. It's basically the location of where traffic unit or object comes to rest after the collision. So uh, we can see where the, uh, if I go back slide here, you can see a collided post collision. This is where our Pontiac Montana ended up with a damage profile, and this is where our uh, Volkswagen uh, uh, bug ended up. And we were actually able to use um, uh, 
we use a uh, equation called momentum and we were able to use some complicated math but work back um, speeds of this of this particular collision and we were able to determine that the Volkswagen bug did not stop uh, as required by law at the uh, stop sign or stop bar and um, came into the path of the Pontiac and was struck on the passenger side. So the next thing I'm going to jump into here is uh, motorcycle collisions. And there are some considerable differences between uh, you know, how a, a four-wheel vehicle and a two-wheel vehicle uh, performs during a collision and how they handle. Uh, so anyone who rides a motorcycle knows that there's quite a difference and uh, then driving a car, uh, number one, you're not wearing a seatbelt, uh, which always presents usually a second equation for us um, because with very few exceptions, uh, the rider and uh, passenger that happens to be one are usually ejected from the motorcycle and uh, we have to calculate for uh, their uh, trajectory and path as well as that of the motorcycle. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of difference just too in the constructions, the way they're constructed, right? In a car, you're protected um, airbags and, uh, you know, crush zones and where a motorcycle, you've sort of got your helmet or hopefully you're wearing your helmet. And um, there's, you know, uh, visibility on the road. And then one of the biggest things is between the two and four wheels is how they actually generate tire marks on the road surface, um, two versus uh, four wheels. So this particular collision here, uh, I'm going to show you. This is a uh, Toyota Corolla, and you can see a severe amount of damage to the rear end of this. So this collision occurred uh, about two in the morning, a rural area, uh, very light rain, but a very dark area. It's lit up with our cameras here, but dark area. And a motorcyclist actually um, crashed into the back of, um, as I just had mentioned, a motorcycle without a headlight crashed into the back of this Toyota and he ended up getting uh, partially bedded through the back window uh, of this vehicle. And um, he of course claimed that this Toyota Corolla pulled out into his uh, path and he struck it. Um, so just another angle out of here, you'll see these uh, three green pylons that I put out here. And those three green pylons uh, in the air indicator of a pre-collision tire mark from the motorcycle. So we do know that the motorcycle um, perceived the hazard and uh, slammed on his brakes, which obviously was too late uh, when he went into the rear end of the car. And these orange um, pylons here, uh, these are uh, the second tire mark. And then if you look just to the left from here, there's a scratch mark and that's where the uh, peg of the um, motorcycle actually hit the ground and then what we have here is uh, this was actually fuel so fuel is a very it's a pretty good indicator of where the bike uh, was at final rest because it's fallen in the you know that as it sat on its side the uh, fuel has leaked from the bike so uh, i know we talked on it there briefly but this is the uh, helmet involved of the said rider and uh, it, it's very important with the motorcycles that a lot of times the helmet gets um, transported to the hospital the doctor wants to see it and sometimes it uh, disappears or we can't get it um, but if you could at the very least have photographs of it it tells a lot of stories like you can see all of the different directional marks on the helmet the scratch marks and there's a you know, chunk missing out of here and uh, you know, not to say this hasn't been in another crash, but most riders don't ride around the helmet like that. So it gives you a pretty good indication of what's happened to the rider once they've been uh, ejected from the bike. So, and in this particular crash, uh, obviously the end result was this driver was charged in the motorcycle. This vehicle was, of course, parked at the side of the road. There was, in fact, glass all over the front seat, which wouldn't have been there if somebody was sitting there. Uh, and the vehicle was parked unoccupied, and the rider has run into the back of that uh, Toyota. So um, this is a pedestrian crash, and I am going to uh, hand this over to uh, Mike. Thanks, Jeff. Do you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
so basically at this point we're going to start, start, start talking about collision, uh, pedestrian collisions. Uh, pedestrian collision is a complete understanding of these events and involving a vehicle pedestrian impact is essential. So to achieve this complete understanding, the right information needs to be gathered as soon as possible following any accident involving pedestrians. Uh, this information includes physical evidence, photographs, measurements of tire marks, vehicle damage, uh, rest position of both uh, the vehicle and the pedestrian, blood stains, and any other debris or evidence you can find on the roadway. Uh, obviously, we require a traffic collision report that is uh, uh, submitted by the police service. And also, if we can obtain uh, medical records of the pedestrian's inj injuries from medical staff or medical records. And also statements from any in or involved parties and witnesses. So just quickly, um, just definition of pedestrian collision is any uh, pedestrian that obviously is walking running and we also include those that are uh, skateboarding or rollerblading and additionally uh, we do wrap the bicycle into that uh, as part of the pedestrian part uh, basically there are three types of pedestrian trajectories uh, involving a collision basically uh, one which i call a wrap which is basically uh, the vehicles uh, has struck a pedestrian uh, at the lower part of the center mass of uh, of a person, and they end up wrapping themselves onto the uh, the vehicle. And I will discuss that one in this following photograph um, collision here. And obviously, then there's forward projections, which basically means the leading edge of the vehicle is quite higher, the center mass of the person, and they get projected forward. And then there's also the restricted or partial um, type trajectories with. Basically restricted is those individuals example where somebody steps out of their motor vehicle with the car door open and then gets struck by another vehicle. There's no real projection because they are stopped by the vehicle's door. And then the other one would be partial where basically maybe the corner of the vehicle has hit this just to uh, swipe the uh, pedestrian so that caused them to um, uh, get struck. So just back up one slide there Jeff if you don't mind. So this uh, case here is involves a single motor vehicle and a, and a pedestrian. Uh, this has occurred about approximately about four o'clock in, in the morning. There's absolutely no lighting. Uh, and obviously you can tell it's a cloudy day. So it was very, very dark that night. Um, so basically uh, this vehicle, it's a posted 60 kilometer hour zone was uh, westbound on this road. And uh, information was a pedestrian was walking eastbound on this on the uh, north uh, side of the roadway heading east and a collision occur between the the vehicle and the pedestrian next slide there jeff so basically in these situations is to determine whether or not the, the vehicle went off the road and struck the pedestrian or did it the pedestrian was it walking on walking on the highway so in this case what i was talking about the different types of uh, trajectories. I call this one a wrap. So this individual is fairly tall. Uh, his center mass was a lot higher than the front end of this uh, vehicle. So therefore his body wrapped onto the vehicle striking. Obviously you can see here the hood and projected into the uh, into the uh, windshield. Next picture Jeff. So basically when we we're talking about the evidence we would find on the roadway um, in the investigation here, the, obviously the question is, was this pedestrian on the roadway or was he not? So in this case, you see the evidence marks on, on this, this individual was wearing fully dark clothes, totally everything was black, including his running shoes. So what you'll see there on the right side is the white uh, fog line and actually the center line is on the left side of the screen. So that is where the vehicle has struck the pedestrian and leaving um, his scuff marks from his shoes uh, and that projected him forward. So that's great evidence for uh, right there what Jeff is pointing at and those are his scuff marks from both his shoes. So this indicates that he is actually in the, in the roadway. Next slide, Jeff. So just to finish off with that, sorry, with that last uh, picture, um, can't get too much into it because this is obviously still a civil issue, but um, 
when we get into the whole medical records and everything else. So it's important that we get this information because actually this this gentleman actually uh, was three times the legal limit as a pedestrian. So it's an unfortunate incident there. So moving on, Jeff, thanks. Uh, commercial motor vehicle collisions is the reconstruction of a commercial motor vehicle traffic collision requires specialized training beyond that of the average traffic collision reconstructionist. Uh, detailed knowledge of uh, the Transport Canada safety regulations, the ability to identify and address trucking safety issues, and a detailed knowledge of the mechanics of a commercial motor vehicle and knowledge of the dynamics of a commercial motor vehicle. So in this case study, um, it was very difficult to uh, get some good uh, pictures for, for you folks, but most, uh, as you can tell, uh, the larger the truck, the more damage it causes. So there wasn't, uh, in this case, this is most collisions occur, it's either driver error or mechanical failure. And in this case, this is actually uh, driver error in the fact that and as a commercial motor vehicle driver, you're required to do logs and you're limited to the amount of dry time, drive time and on duty time. And in this case, uh, this happened actually just on the roadway in a parking lot. And this uh, gentleman, the truck driver, was offloading um, vehicles for sale to this dealership. Um, upon inspection of his log books, he was well over his drive time. So obviously his fatigue had an issue here. Um, when offloading these vehicles, you'll see the front of the hydraulics on this. I don't know if you can point to that, Jeff, just in front of the hood there. That arm, when you're offloading, they're supposed to be fully extended. So you actually would see the level of that front of that truck, the, of the railing out there should be well above level. As you, obviously you can see from that picture, it was tilted forward. The driver got into the vehicle and he put it into drive, but failed to keep his foot on the brake and actually the vehicle went off the back, so, or off the front of the front of the truck there. So you can change that, Jeff. So as you can tell, um, this vehicle, about an $80,000 vehicle, uh, landed on the very rear of the uh, back of the, the SUV, and then it clipped the front of the uh, tractor as it came down and ripped the whole front end off. So this was a total write-off. Uh, this driver of the tractor trailer who was m removing this vehicle, he was severe, seriously injured and uh, spent some time in the hospital. And therefore, these, you know, Obviously, commercial trucks are, as I said, are big and large. And it's important to uh, that we can uh, look at log books um, to determine whether or not they're way going way past their drive time and obviously causing fatigue or uh, any other issues. And then, of course, uh, we can inspect vehicles. In this case, this truck did have some mechanical issues too. So uh, there are uh, certain levels of inspect, excuse me, inspections for uh, investigating commercial motor vehicles. There's level one, level two, and level three inspections. And level one is a full inspection of a uh, commercial motor vehicle. And in this case, I did it coincides. Uh, I would do a level one inspection on this to, because there's injuries, I would do a complete mechanical on the vehicle as well. So next slide, Jeff. Guess that's okay. over to you. Yeah, I can take over from there. Uh, so for this next uh, couple slides, uh, I am going to, uh, speaking of uh, an actual assignment that we took uh, at Origin Calls, where our investigators took and kind of go through it uh, as an example. Uh, some, you know, we may receive assignment from either an adjuster or a lawyer involving a loss, and it's our responsibility to complete an unbiased objective analysis um, of all provided documentation for review to assist the said client review of the events contained uh, therein. So in this particular case here, uh, this example here, this assignment was one of our investigators received. This is a rural road in Ontario. It's a uh, two motor vehicle collision, uh, basically a Toyota Camry versus a Dodge Ram. The collision itself was initially investigated by members of the Ontario Provincial Police, a level one collision investigator. And uh, both, of course, both the driver of the Camry and the driver of the Ram state that the other uh, had crossed over the center line and um, caused the collision. 
So um, the investigator has basically reviewed all the provided documentation. Uh, documentation was provided to them. And uh, in this particular case, there was a closure reconstruction report. They also went through uh, court proceedings, court files, uh, any of the testimony by either the drivers involved and um, any notes, reports from attending police officers uh, and, or, and or diagrams from the scene. They uh, investigated weather conditions and um, they went through all of the uh, photographs provided by not only plaintiff and the defendant, but also taken by the police service. Uh, and our investigators went through the condition of the vehicles, uh, you know, tire conditions, and uh, all the roadway evidence. So one of the things uh, that I mentioned there was uh, any collision like this, even a, a basic collision, a lot of officers are taught to do uh, diagrams in their duty book in their duty book. Uh, and then uh, as you get into level three, level four, you're actually getting out a sketch pad and actually doing a sketch. Uh, like I talked about, evidence is perishable. And sometimes you can pick up quite information just from, um, from the actual sketch. So um, in this particular example here, our, we don't, you know, uh, we do come to some of the scenes, generally we review the stuff, but we can't come back. And I believe this was a, um, a year and a half later and uh, our officer was able to find uh, evidence. Uh, you can see her circled in the orange paint, evidence uh, of the collision um, after the fact, a year and a half after the fact. So uh, of note, kind of, it was really interesting in this one, um, and it's still ongoing, so can't give a lot of information away from it, but um, in sworn testimony, um, the driver of the Camry in this particular case um, had talked about, uh, let me go back here, the driver of the Camry who was uh, southbound here on the street had said that um, uh, that she had crossed over and collided with the passenger side of the um, Dodge Ram. And when our investigator actually went through the uh, the photographs that provided, he was able to determine there was actually no damage to the passenger side of the um, actual Dodge Ram. Uh, it, it, not necessarily saying that the um, driver of the Camry lied or gave false testimony. And we, you know, because it's pretty traumatic, people don't remember a lot, but it does show that the physical evidence doesn't match up with the, uh, the particular uh, testimony given by the uh, uh, driver of the Camry in this particular collision. Uh, so just some of the stuff we do in our vehicle examinations, I mean, we go over tombstone stuff and that's, uh, you know, your, your basic uh, make model of the car and VIN number and stuff. Uh, document exterior damage, uh, tire rim examinations, you know, was a tire flat? Um, you know, uh, what's the track with the, the car for you to match that stuff? Interior examinations, was there um, evidence inside the car of, um, you know, blood on the ceiling or, uh, you know, we're looking at seat belts or seat belts being worn. Uh, lamp examinations with LEDs, that's getting a little tougher, but uh, with traditional halogen lights, we could uh, tell if lights were activated or brake lights were activated at the time of the collision. That is the, um, is the filament would heat up and the involved of the collision would cause the filament to uh, expand and then, and then we could actually see that in the, uh, ex physically examine the light. Uh, so, one of the other things uh, we do is we do uh, aerial mapping, and uh, that is if we have the opportunity, um, we can put a drone up into the air, get measurements and grades, and, uh, and in fact, this particular uh, photograph you're looking at right here was taken by an investigator at this collision we're talking about, uh, who's able to find, and obviously in the orange spray paint here, he's marked up gouges and uh, some evidence that he's taken from an overhead uh, of the drone. So the program we use uh, for aerial mapping is called Drone Deploy. And from that, we can obtain, you know, slope uh, scene measurements and a lot of uh, real-time data versus outdated Google Maps. That is, uh, you know, 
what you see on Google Maps in an overhead uh, photo is not the same as what we would be able to generate from uh, using drone deployment. Uh, I mean, in a nutshell, basically what it does is it takes a series of photographs, I believe it was 161 photographs in this particular collision, and the program um, stitches 161 photographs together. So basically you get one photograph, but it's very, very good quality. You can zoom in and that's where you can take any kind of measurements of areas, slope, uh, et cetera. You can also, uh, from point cloud generate a 3d model and of course the 2d model and we're also able to uh, generate panoramic photographs as well so i'm going to show you an example here this is this is from this collision now this might take a second to load and here it is let me know can you guys see this popping up my screen not that if you can't see it let me know otherwise i'll continue um, but this is the actual uh, drone deploy flown um, at the scene. So if I zoom in here, just take a second to load. But you can see the quality of here. On the right, that is um, Google Maps. And then we basically overlaid it. And then here is actually the quality. So I'll zoom out a bit there. So you can see how better of a quality this is, these 161 photos stitched together. And right here, there's an example of a measurement uh, Darren has taken. Uh, here, our investigator took. Um, you can see all the roadway evidence on it. But basically, we can take any of anything you see here and, and gather measurements, uh, whatever is required. Let me just get back here. Okay, that should be back up. You guys can see if you can't see that let me know so one of the other things we can do with the aerial mapping is uh, uh it's very easy to drone deploy specifically to we can actually just send out a link and there's a uh, executable program where anybody can open that up on the computer you can't um, edit or change it after but you can uh, use it for someone to view and we're just going to show you the 3d version here if i could Reopen this. Is it open still? For some reason, I'm not able to. I will move on. I apologize. There we go. There we go. Okay. It's taking a little long to load, but so I guess we got some internet here. I get some error messages, but hopefully you can see that this is a uh, takes a lot of data, obviously, but we can open this up because it's 3D and take a look, and it gives a very good. Uh, perspective or recreation of the scene for someone who hasn't been there uh, or if things have changed uh, in the meantime. Okay, continuing on. So I believe we're going to be doing a whole uh, presentation on crash data retrieval, so I won't um, spend a ton of time on it, but I'll just touch on it uh, gen uh, gently here. Um, it's kind of, for those who don't know, they, it's commonly referred to as a black box car, although it's really nothing like black box of an airplane. Um, but generally a crash data, um, the crash data at the uh, uh, retrieval devices will be used to get it, but every vehicle sold in North America since 2013 uh, has to have um, an airbag module in it. And basically what it is, is it's like a uh, very smart little computer that sits in your car and measures changes in velocities and it makes the decision whether or not uh, to activate the car's airbags. Uh, was the collision severe enough uh, to activate the airbags? And, uh, you know, it, Either it will or it won't, but that is generally recorded in either what we call a uh, uh, 
uh, a deployment event, or not deployment event. So there really is. This is since I started uh, doing recon years ago. This has been kind of the most important piece of information. It's um, it really paints a complete picture of what occurred and uh, who was at fault. And like I said, it's been in almost every vehicle since uh, 2013. Uh, and this this is actually a picture of the device we own. Uh, we have one of these called the Boss CDR, and it can plug in two different ways. One, it can plug into the um, uh, right under the dash, or we can plug into the module itself to get the information. And uh, we've even been able to uh, acquire data from vehicles that have been involved in fires. So just briefly, how it works is there's a list here of these are mandatory data points. Now, there are a lot of vehicles that you get a lot more information than this, but uh, basically every vehicle should have uh, the impact severity, that is the change in measure change in velocity. The vehicle speed and most um, give at least five seconds of kind of uh, pre-collision speed. Any steering input, uh, accelerator pedal input, uh, brake input, uh, the ignition cycles and whether the seatbelt was worn and whether or not the uh, airbags themselves actually deployed and this here, um, sorry, I just want to show you an example of a collision that uh, I investigated. I took this from a uh, Cadillac CTS. This was a collision involved. And basically what happened in this collision was, was uh, occurred on an on-ramp on a major QEW, uh, QEW highway. And one driver rear-ended this Cadillac that you see here in um, the driver that rear ended the Cadillac had said that the Cadillac pulled up the side of the road and pulled directly in front of his car and he collided into the back of it. So you can see uh, from this download here, the Cadillac at the time of collision, where are we here? A little arrow, you can see it was actually in park. And then if we look down here um, at speeds, so we got, you know, these are minus one, minus two, minus three. This means pre-crash, five seconds before the crash. If we look at the vehicle speed at zero, 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 and the engine RPM, we can see is, you know, just over 500. So this, uh, what this does show us is that is, in fact, the uh, driver of the Cadillac, the Cadillac itself was parked on the side of the road, and it did not pull out in front of the vehicle as the other driver had stated. Uh, the other driver, in fact, ran into the back of a uh, parked vehicle. So once we've uh, received your assignment and reviewed all the facts and, and done any follow-up, uh, whether that be on scene um, or you know, uh, locating the car itself or inspection, was a CDR available? Uh, we actually start going through the data and coming up with um, an analysis. And um, so once we've reviewed all that, we come up with a conclusion. And uh, our conclusion is to value all available documentation information and data available to the investigator to present an objective conclusion report. Uh, any uh, summation of the events from objective conclusive uh, perspective presented to the client in a post analysis format. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out a, a few things if uh, you guys are investigating a collision uh, or you have one that you're reporting to us. Just some of the stuff I want you to make you aware of that is available to the collective if you don't know. Uh, it's important to us as we start going through it. Uh, any photographs at all, whether that be you know from dash cam, which is great, but any photographs taken by a client uh, after the fact, uh, and even taken by the police. Um, we saw in that last case study there how important the photographs were. Um, we're looking for uh, CDR information that is um, police involved in any serious uh, fatal collisions will. Um, do a download and uh, you know if you could obtain that information for us and if it's if it is a series of collisions, there's a good chance it's been investigated by like a level three level four because reconstructionist so they have done probably a much more detailed report than your standard motor vehicle accident report which uh, you know we still need but um, they'll generally do uh, a lot more in-depth report and which we call like a reconstruction report or a TCI, like a collision investigation. 
and um, I, I talked about briefly there, the field sketch generally done in a serious collision piece of paper. If you get that, any officer's notes um, to go through and, you know, sometimes you get a lot of information from the officer's notes. Um, and that last one we talked about there uh, with the Toyota Camry versus the Dodge Ram and one of the officer's notes, um, one of the officers just assigned to protect the scene, that is to park the cruiser across the road and make sure nobody gets hurt and make sure that no evidence is disturbed. Made notes that um, it was snowing heavy and that a salt truck actually came down the road and he had to turn the salt truck away, but uh, it just speaks to the conditions of the, the roadway that day. Um, any statements, and I don't mean um, necessarily just statements taken by witnesses, obviously they're very important, but uh, any officers provided statements and any uh, court uh, related documents. And I think that moves us into the uh, question period. Uh, Mark, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Chef. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, I'll let you guys kind of uh, decide amongst yourselves who's going to field which. Uh, this first one, uh, how is the point of actual perception determined? I'll take that if you want, Mike. So uh, basically what we will do, and, and it's something we need to actually have the diagram done. So uh, real briefly, how we do the diagram is uh, we can use it traditionally with a total station that is like a surveying uh, instrument or two, we can uh, put up a, a drone and use a program and actually come up with a diagram. But we will place the vehicles on the roadway and we will actually draw a straight line uh, from what we consider a, like an obstacle of, of uh, you know, perception. So that is a tree or a bush or a house. In this particular case, it was trees. And we'll just sort of draw a line. We'll sort of back the vehicles up from what we know their speeds to be. And um, to the point where uh, the line actually is a straight line connects from one vehicle to another, um, where you would actually be able to see uh, said vehicle without actually not having to look through the tree or house, whatever the obstacle was. Okay, no, I know you talked about the um, possible perception and then the actual perception. And I think there's a, a delay of what 0.75 seconds in between the two. Yeah, so it's three, minimum. three quarters of a second. Yeah. So, what would you do in, in the case of, say, a distracted driver? Would you maybe reverse engineer the point of actual perception from the point of, uh, of reaction instead? It's pretty hard to prove that somebody was distracted, and I'm sure you're referring to like talking on the phone unless we had video. So we, we generally, when we're doing all of our um, uh, calculations, we'll give the driver the benefit of the doubt and mm -hmm. usually go a quarter of a second, like keep it as a minimum. But you're, you're totally right, and unfortunately, it's uh, more common than ever now is uh, people on cell phones, and that may be considerably longer than three quarters of a second. And in some particular cases, they may not actually perceive it at all, and unfortunately, that happens uh, quite so often. Hmm, interesting. Uh, could you explain what you mean by tombstone data? Oh, I apologize. Yeah, so that's uh, just a term uh, we're taught as we go through um, our policing levels, but tombstone data, I don't know where, what the actual, why it's actually called that, but that's for training. It's basically your, uh, you know, 2017 Hyundai Santa Fe VIN number, uh, whatever, one, two, three, uh, four door. It's, it's just your your very uh, basic uh, stuff of the vehicle that wouldn't change. It's regardless of whether the vehicle's in a crash or not. So um, just your, all, all of your uh, basic stuff from the vehicle. Okay. Uh, do motorcycles have a black box? That was in, that was in quotes, black box, uh, to assist with accident analysis or is it exclusive? to four-wheel vehicles? Nope, uh, great question. So there are some uh, vehicles and I believe, I know for sure Honda has it on some of their higher end stuff, but I think BMW might too. There are some actual motorcycles equipped with uh, their version of an airbag if the collision goes off and uh, that would be, uh, you would be able to extract some information from that. I have not done that myself. I don't know, Mike, if you've had a, if you've been fortunate enough to have a, or unfortunate to have a motorcycle with an airbag yet in the collision? No, I haven't. And I, I agree, yes, I've, I've heard that BMW and uh, um, Honda were uh, on the market now with a few out there. 
would it be the same process and the same equipment to extract the data? Yeah, I, I, took, I don't know if Mike, you can comment more than I have. I haven't uh, had that opportunity yet come up, so uh, I assume there would be there. Um, the manufacturers themselves would be able to gather the data, so I, I assume that uh, Bosch, the particular company we have, is, uh, and I'm just assuming now, has come up with a solution to download uh, that said information. I mean, some definitely. I would. I'll. I'm gonna make a note of that and definitely look into that, for sure. Okay, great. So we'll uh, to the, the person who asked that question. We'll we'll get back to you um, with that information as well. Uh, if if airbags if airbags do not deploy, you can't get accident information for retrieval. Is that correct? Nope, uh, that's another great question. So there's what we call a deployment event and a non-deployment event. If a vehicle is involved in a crash, um, basically if there's enough uh, delta V or change in velocity from that crash, or, or the, air, the, uh, the airbag will, module will wake up and it'll go, okay, what's happening? What's happening? Do I need to deploy the airbags? And sometimes it'll be like, you know what? They're wearing the seatbelt, they're not going that fast. I don't need to deploy the airbags, but that will still be recorded as a non-deployment event. So it, it does happen from uh, time to time that we'll have uh, non-deployment events, yes. So in the case of a non-deployment event, how long is that data available if the, if the vehicle is continued to be driven? So it's uh, particular to each vehicle, but I would say generally uh, it is there until it's uh, something else records over that data, i.e. there's another uh, non-deployment or there's actually a deployment event. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, who owns the CDR data? Uh, vehicle owner, manufacturer, or insurance company? Oh, good question. I'm going to pass that one to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you talking from that module itself, or are you talking to who owns crash data? Uh, Not really sure. I follow that. I can't. Yeah. So if the uh, if the person who asked that question if, uh, clarify that, uh, that'd be fantastic. Uh, if not, we'll we'll email you. We'll get back to you. I mean, as best we can. I mean, at the at the end of the day, if we're talking like um, you know, the person owns the vehicle and he has you know. There's some case law with that as well, but um, you know, we would, if you're talking from a policing perspective, then you know, in most cases, we would get a, a search warrant to obtain that information. However, if the insurance company is now the owner of the vehicle and they wanted us to, you know, obtain the information, then no, we wouldn't need a warrant or anything like that. But I'm not really sure if that's what he would, they were asking. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so please let us know if that answers your question. Uh, and if not, uh, we'll uh, see what we can do. Um, how do you assess the contribution of blockages to the driver's line of sight with vehicle features such as A pillars, mirrors, etc.? How do you collect data to quantify the obstructions to visibility? Uh, I think so. I'm just speaking from my personal. Uh, we will a lot of times. Uh, Generally, it's, we're talking uh, pedestrian collisions when somebody gets hit and there might be something hanging from the mirror or, or some kind of thing. We will actually, uh, generally, what the driver will say to the pedestrian is, I didn't see him. I didn't see him. I, you know, came out of nowhere. So we will actually reenact a lot of those crashes with video and it helps a lot to show, uh, you know, if we can, will you actually use the vehicle involved in the collision? If not, we'll get a similar vehicle and we'll have a, we've actually have like a, uh, we'll use other police officers and have them dress up in similar clothing. And to prove, I mean, maybe they couldn't be seen, maybe there was an obstruction in the vehicle or, yeah, you, you must, there's something else you were doing because you should have seen uh, that person. Interesting. Yeah. That, uh, I I think that concludes your questions, unless anyone has anything else in the next couple minutes. Um, but if not, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, like I said, we have another webinar coming up uh, starting at 2.15. That's on uh, staircase construction. We're going to kind of do a deep dive into the Ontario Building Code and, and slip and falls um, as a result of building code violations. So I'm going to, if you haven't registered and you are interested, I'm just going to uh, drop the link in the chat. Uh, and you should be able to register there. So that's gonna, uh, you'll have to leave this webinar and join another one. That's gonna be in about 15 minutes. 
Uh, and since I don't see any questions coming up, um, I, I think we'll still take our lead. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Uh, Mike and Jeff, thank you so much for presenting. Uh, it's really fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.